And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit www.sans.org to learn more. This segment also brought to you by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud. Engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, a man who's an ounce of vermouth short of a Manhattan, Paul Esidorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul's Security Weekly. This is episode 386 for Thursday, September 4th, 2014. Very excited to be here. I've got a cast of characters with me tonight to present to you all kinds of fun and interesting things about computer security. Mr. Jack Daniel, to my right, are you ready? I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, let me take a couple of these pills and I'll be ready in a couple hours. <laughs> ah. Just hopefully not more than four hours. Four <laughs> <laughs> um, On the lines via Skype, we've got Mr. Carlos Perez. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Good to have you here tonight, as well as Mr. Joff Thayer. Welcome, Joff. Hey, good day, Paul. Good to be here again. Good day. Mick Douglas is here with us tonight as well. Welcome, Mick. Hey, hey, everyone. Good to have you. Uh, before we get into our special interview for this show, just a couple of quick announcements. The PVS contest, Passive Vulnerability Scanner, is still going strong. Click to register in the show notes to enter the PVS contest and win, potentially win, an AR drone. So that should be fun. Um join me for the webcast that would have happened today had we not had some audio problems that is being rescheduled until next week five things you're not doing with your vulnerability scanner can you hear me now can you hear me? there were apparently some some technical difficulties that we had today so we've had to reschedule that uh, broadcast will happen next week so check the uh, my twitter account at sign security weekly for updates on that um, also, I, we've got a new course, Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us, which will teach students how to assess embedded systems of all varieties on penetration tests and in your duties as a security professional. The link to register is in the show notes, and the discount code SECWEEK10 will give out at the end of the show. Oh, did I? Did I, I say SECWEEK10? SEC SEC week 10 yeah. That's the discount code which we'll give out at the end of the show. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> a couple <laughs> more updates. Larry's teaching wireless 617, wireless ethical hacking, penetration testing, and defense at Sands Las Vegas from October 20th through the 25th. My class will be immediately following the 26th and the 27th. You can purchase Hack Naked t-shirts online, shop.securityweekly.com even. Get yours today. Securityweekly.corn is a different. That's, our, that's, that's very, our, very different. <laughs> very, very, very different. different. Um, and that's pretty much it for announcements. I'd like to introduce our very special guest, who's uh, somewhat of a veteran to the Security Weekly show. Like, I think this might be your third appearance on the show. Is that right? I think it's actually my fifth. Fifth. Wow. You are just, we might as well just make you a co-host, dude. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, Mike is obviously no stranger to the show. Uh, the last time he came on, Mike was uh, co-founding and acting as the one of the founders for Mad Security um, and also the Hacker Academy. 
Um, Mike now has uh, a day job, which uh, I want to talk about. Uh, Mike, explain what your current role is today for our listeners. Yeah, so uh, I decided that running a company was was not enough of a challenge, so I decided to take the hardest possible job on the planet and uh, went to a major medical device manufacturer to help them secure their products. Um, specifically, you know, I, I work at GE Healthcare. It's one of the largest companies. I mean, GE is one of the largest companies in the world, and uh, incredibly diverse and incredibly, you know, my team is global. I have, I currently have headcount in Budapest and Bangalore. So, any Paul.com listeners who are or viewers who are in Budapest or Bangalore, uh, hit me up um, because I'm looking for awesome security people around the world to help us um, secure our medical devices. So, is it? Uh, are you focused on just medical devices in the software that in hardware that surrounds those devices at GE, Mike? Well, so realize if if you go on the if you go on the GE Healthcare website, you start to see the the diversity of the products that are made on for the company. And obviously, I'm not a company spokesperson, so I don't I don't speak for you know. I'm doing the, the typical corporate disclaimer. Any opinions I have are my own, right? And and I'm not speaking for the company, but that's why you know we the products are the the this company makes are everything from the smallest handheld scanner to cloud services to mobile apps to the biggest, you know, room-sized MRI, CT scanner kind of device. It, it's um, it's as diverse a product line as I could imagine seeing anywhere. So, you know, obviously software is a big part of, of that and, and um, security is a big part of that. You know, security is a big deal in healthcare. I mean, just look at the last three weeks. In, I mean, we're, we're recording this and they just, um, the big news hit today that healthcare.gov was hacked you know, Catholic Health Systems had had their breach a couple of weeks ago. Like, healthcare is a, a big thing in security right now, and uh, and being at one of the largest providers of healthcare equipment in the world, it, you know, it's a lot of work. So you're again, you're focused on just healthcare, Mike. Healthcare products. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I, I only work in G. I only work in GE Healthcare. I don't work for the rest of GE. Okay, that just helps me focus our conversation for. The security sure. of, you know, any of those probes that might be inserted in people, right? <laughs> I care. I have nothing, I have nothing to do with any of that. I care that those <laughs> devices are accurate and secure. Wait, wait, till you're my, wait till you're my age. You'll really care about the security of probes. Uh, uh, soft hands and secure probes. So, Mike, let, <laughs> let's... And good depth perception. Yeah. No. Very important. <laughs> oh, kidding. Uh. Mike, let, let's start talking about the security development life cycle and, um, or software development life cycle um, and how it relates to devices. Are, is there different strategies and techniques that can allow you to be more effective when making software for these embedded systems, to essentially, especially purpose-built devices, um, as opposed to, you know, developing a web application for something else? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak to anything specific that we're doing internally, obviously, but, uh, I mean, to me, good security is good security. You know, there's, and and if you do a good job of securing the product from the very bottom to the very top, um, you know, of the of the technology stack, Across the board, it doesn't matter to me what if it's a web app or if it's some crazy, you know, Joe Bob hand wrote his OS in his basement kind of kind of thing. Um, the principles are the same. You know, the principles of uh, of access control and authorization and sanitizing your inputs were the same when we were writing in C plus plus as they are when we we're writing in Ruby on Rails. Right. Right. So nothing really has changed. The, the implementation specifics change across the security development lifecycle. But to me, the technology stack is much less in, uh, an effect. I, I see a lot less of an effect in the technology stack changing the way that we do SDL uh, than I do in the way that the development environment changes the way we do SDL. Um, you know, I, I have seen, and this is, this is everywhere in our industry, I, I mean, we're still... We're still, as an industry, struggling with the idea of making security an agile process. You know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about agile security, and, and it really, it's like Microsoft SDL for agile. 
which is really the and not to you know not to rip on Microsoft, they they do really great things in a lot of ways. But their SDL for Agile is basically taking a waterfall SDL and saying, hey, do some pieces of this sometimes, you know, on some of your sprints. Just break it up and and just sort of you know mix it and match it in there. It's not really an Agile SDL. It's a waterfall SDL. Actually, I saw I saw a really interesting term on uh, on Urban Dictionary recently, and it, it was the idea of avalanche development. Um, avalanche <laughs> is what you get when you when you do waterfall and agile at the same time. Um, and I, I just loved that term. And I think I think security is still in the in the position of being far too often we're the avalanche. You know, we've got this agile development life cycle, and then we say, hey guys. How about you guys just wait for six weeks while we do a full scope pen test before you release that product? And they're like, well, we're on a four week development life cycle. What are you talking about? What, what do you mean six weeks? And we go, sorry, security. And, and sort of wave our doctor no badge and, and everything stops. And I think um, we're still struggling with that as an industry. I think that's much more of a, of a you know, a, an industry wide issue than technology stack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. <clears throat> um, so with medical devices, you know, what are some of the, the challenges in terms of allowing them to work, which is, of course, extremely important, right, and balancing the, the security of those systems? I'm sure you must have conversation with healthcare providers along those lines, right? And I think it is somewhat akin to industrial control systems and somewhat similar to some of the retail breaches that we've seen as the point-of-sale device is now largely becoming a target, right? These are all devices that, you know, retail is not life-threatening, right? But these are all devices that have to work and have to work properly. And as you said, when you come in with that avalanche of, of security, you know, how do you balance that in a healthcare setting? Yeah, you know, and, and I, again, you just, you just nailed it. It's not just healthcare, right? Um, this is an across-the-board problem. And I, 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 don't, I don't see any of these problems as healthcare-specific. I've sat in, like... I sat in a really great room um, around Black Hat time with a whole bunch of IoT, you know, Internet of Things, uh, G, we call it the industrial internet, you, you know, the, the, whole, the whole idea that all of our devices are becoming internet aware. And, and every device maker has this same problem in that most device makers, and whether this, is, whether this is some industrial control system or something that powers a nuclear power plant or a point of sale terminal, device makers have long have long had two use cases, right? They have the use case of intended use, which is the use case that they care about. Um, you know, we're using the product intentionally. And they have the, the accidental misuse case, right? The, the person, you know, fat fingers the way that they do the terminal or they plug the, uh, they plug the cables into the wrong ports. Does the product still work and not explode? Kind of thing. And, and this, is, this is true of medical devices as well. Like those are the use cases that every device maker has has worried about for for all time, you know, medical uh, to industrial control to, to all of those, and and we come in and we go, hey guys, what about the bad guy who's going to use the product wrong? And it, nobody's ever thought about that before. You yeah. know, go go talk to people who designed a power plant, and and they're they're designing their stuff in a very specific way. And, and it's, it's, will it work the way it's supposed to? And if someone does something dumb, will it, will it continue to, will it not explode? Right. And, and that two things is really the only two things anybody gets to, to think about when designing their products. And, and what we're seeing is that you plug those into the internet and you give attackers incentive to go outside those, those lines, the entire industry has to rework. Right, you know whether it's somebody building uh, an internet connected refrigerator, or um, you know we all know yeah, about Barnaby but, Jack's work with with insulin pumps, or Jay no. Radcliffe's work with with insulin stuff, uh, insulin pumps as well. Yeah, but now, um, Mike, what you, you know, describe there's, there's all kinds of people who are seeing the same thing. What you describe are usability and reliability. Doesn't security factor into those two things by nature? Well, it does now. Yeah, well, it does now, right? But but if you think about security 25 or 30 years ago, um, the security of your average refrigerator was a, was a pretty much a non-entity, right? It's, it's just this idea of taking all of these things that were never meant to be plugged into the Internet and plugging them into the Internet. Mm. Um, you know, like a, a, 
I'm sorry. There, there are parts of nuclear power plants that really shouldn't be on the internet, but they probably are. Mm-hmm. Right. And and that's and and so those all of those reliability. I mean, do you guys know what what an FMEA is? Failure mode effects analysis. Nope. But I gotta imagine you're gonna tell us. <laughs> well, you no, know, I just yeah. So, I, I will. Um, so it's it's a design. So it's a design principle for for building systems that basically you figure out all the failure modes, all the ways that the product can possibly fail to work. And then you design around them. Like you said, Paul, it's reliability, right? Like that's that. I mean, to me, in a lot of ways, security is a reliability uh, issue. Um, you know, we rely on the product not to, you know, we rely on our refrigerator not to become part of a botnet. Like that, that to me is part of a reliability issue. Um, you know, I rely on my insulin pump not to get hacked and, you know, not to be controllable by someone other than me or my doctor. Yeah, and uh, I, I think and, you, you speak and, to it, Mike, right? Like, it's it's about that loss of control that it seems right. hasn't entered into the equation, right? We talk about usability. We talk about reliability. But both those two things yeah. can become compromised if you lose control of that device because you designed the product and it had a default password exactly. and anyone can log into it. Yeah, and, and, and you just nailed it. You, you just nailed exactly the problem, right? That's, that's exactly it. The, is that all of those reliability things always assumed that you were on, that, that no one was ever trying to take control right. of, of something from you. You know, and, and I had it explained to me um, by someone who used a scalpel as his example. Um, and this was actually, this was before I even went to GE. Someone explained it to me this way because um, I was talking to them about this, this, whole, this, this whole conversation we're having. Um, and he said, he said this, think about a scalpel, right? Because we, we go through the same design principles for that kind of medical device as every other kind of medical device. When you're designing a scalpel, you want to make sure that it cuts when it cuts, when it's supposed to, and doesn't cut when it's not supposed to. You're not going to design it so that if someone tries to stab somebody with them, Mm -hmm. with it, it doesn't kill them. Right. That's that malicious use case, right? That's Mm -hmm. that chaotic actor that, that suddenly you put the thing on the internet and there are people trying to do that with these devices. And suddenly we, we have to take, you know, whether it's, whether it's industrial control, whether it's the, ref, you know, the internet connected refrigerator, I mean, all the stuff we've seen with cars, mm-hmm. all of these things, it's all the idea that, you know, the only person that's going to get in a, in a car and try and drive over someone is the person behind the wheel. And you can't stop them from doing that. They've never had to design the car so that, you know, with the idea that the car could be taken over and driven by somebody not behind the wheel that might want to drive over someone. No, that's a very right? and, and it's, it's a just, very interesting take on the embedded systems and Internet of Things, whatever you want to call it, uh, security topic that we've discussed. Um, that you're right, they don't design for that scenario. Right, and then, and you know, you asked you asked about healthcare because that's where I, where I live now. But it's not that's not a healthcare problem, right? That's a that's an everywhere problem. Right. And and you know that those things are true in a lot of the healthcare. Like I I look at I mean Jay Radcliffe's a great example. Like I've looked at a lot of his research, and and you know he has done exactly those things, right? And he, Jay did a bunch of research on on his own insulin pump and how he could basically take it over and do do horrible things to it. And it's it's all the failure to understand that that suddenly when you put it on the internet. The idea of the primary user being the person in control of the device mm-hmm. um, goes away and, and is replaced by the ability for someone a million miles away to become the primary user of the device and possibly act maliciously in a way that the device was never intended to handle. And, and that one design principle is across all of these different things. It's across healthcare. It's across, um, you know, it's across uh, ICS. It's, it's in power plants. It's in cars. It's in all of this internet of things stuff like all of these things were built as though that the person on the keyboard is the only person who can be on the keyboard Mm -hmm. and and that one design principle it doesn't change overnight you know like that stuff that's going to take us it's going to take us as a as a world a while to get over now i mean that's one of the big things behind this yeah and i think an attacker uh with control of a device is kind of one that's one of the major aspects of, of this level of security, right? Now, when I think of uh, some of the other reasons, right, we tend to turn to privacy and, and data leakage, right, being able to access yeah. um, 
the information that these devices are collecting and transmitting, I'm sure in the medical field, right, that's, that's important. But more and more, some of it through my own war driving, I've seen medical devices that are transmitting and collecting information via wireless and all these different mechanisms, right? And in a healthcare setting, that's yeah, important, absolutely. right? You want the people that can solve your medical issues to have the information that they want as quickly as possible. So, of course, we turn to yep. the Internet, wireless protocols, and all this new technology. But, of course, there's privacy concerns with that. How do you uh, address some of those, in, in especially the healthcare setting? Well, I mean, the, the, you, you nailed it, and I think, I think it's, it's beyond just what you're talking about, right? It's not just wireless. It's cloud, and it's mobile, yep. and, um, you know, it's it's always on. It's always accessible. It's it's exactly what we're seeing everywhere else, right? Um, you know, everyone wants to be able to do everything from wherever they are. You know, I'm mm -hmm. I'm most frustrated when I can't get my email on my cell phone. You know, while I'm walking through an airport, which 15 years ago that would have been a crazy, crazy idea. Um, and, and I think you know the the older industries, the the manufacturing industries like healthcare, are, are finally catching up to that. Right. You know, 15 years ago, we figured out how to put like wireless on Blackberries and start to have our email everywhere we went. And, you know, I remember I'm dating myself, but I remember back in that time and there was all this like, oh, my goodness, if everyone has laptops, we're going to lose all of our data everywhere. And, you know, we lost a bunch of data for a while. Yeah. And, you know, then we got over it and we I mean, we still lose a bunch of data. Don't get me wrong. Not a solved problem, really? <laughs> but it's a heck of a lot better now than it was in 2001. Um, I, I saw an article today, um, and I didn't actually get to even read the article. I just got to read the headline, and then I got off on another call because, you know, that's how life goes. But, but the headline was something to the effect of 90% of hospitals lose their patients' information. Um, mm. And I don't know if that's U.S. or worldwide. I don't, I don't know any of the demographics on that, but it was, it was a headline today on a news article I started to read. Um, I, I think healthcare in general, as an industry, and this is not even this is not even as a device manufacturer. I'm not even thinking about this from a device perspective because honestly, it's it's a it's a pervasive healthcare problem. Healthcare is losing information, right? They they do that. Um, there's been a lot of examples of that over the past few years, and the industry is catching up to that. You know, we went through it uh, what eight years ago now, where um, a lot of financial services lost a whole lot of information, and then we got PCI, and we, you know, we got religion a little bit, and we largely figured it out not to, you I, know, I, I'm a, I mean, there's still no, tar no. Target and JP Morgan and all of those, but, um, PCI is a you know, cult. We, we at least put some effort behind it, and I think, I, I think healthcare is doing the same now, you know, as, as an industry-wide thing, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, as someone who has my medical records, in hospitals here. I am excited about that. Yeah. One of the interesting yeah. challenges of, of healthcare is that uh, they, you're literally dealing with life and death stuff. And so when you try to secure things, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know if you and I chatted about this, but, you know, I um, am at an age where I get to visit friends in hospitals with some reg depressing regularity. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> There's nothing like, uh, hey, I'll see you later. It's almost the end of closing time in here. You know, it's almost the end of visiting hours. And hearing the nurse uh, going around with a little uh, medicine cart, yelling down the hall to one of the other nurses, hey, does your computer work? Um, and then walking out and seeing a, uh, I forget the exact, the exact error message, but it was basically unable to authenticate. There was, a, you know, apparently a network connectivity issue. They couldn't authenticate to Active Directory. And so they had to fall back. And thankfully, it was easy enough to fall back. But they had to fall back to, you know, getting the keys, unlocking things manually, scribbling down notes, which, of course, are now paper notes sitting on top of a cart in a hallway because the nurse's responsibility is... Uh, the health, safety, and comfort of the patients. And so if uh, security gets in the way of that, then that's arguably worse than losing their confidential data. I'd say, I wouldn't even say arguably, right? If you get in the way of patient yeah, care... Yeah, not arguable. Right. If you get in the way of patient care with your, you know, air quotes, security, you're forgetting safety, which needs to be the ultimate priority. Right. So that's, um, these aren't theoretical things. These are... Uh, this is it doesn't get any more visceral than the issues you face in healthcare 
Uh, that doesn't excuse yeah. not giving a crap about patients' uh, medical records, uh, insurance records, confidential data, financial data, all of those things. Uh, but it is it is interesting that um, you're really talking about dire consequences. Yeah, and and I will say that I have learned a, an incredible appreciation for for the work that the FDA does. Um, you know, because we all we all tend to to rail on you know government regulation and things like that. But I will say that that the FDA's um, regulations around around management of quality around safety are um, are masterful. You, you know, and if it, like because of exactly what you said, Jack, like. The thing that that I've seen, um, you know, uh, over over many years, but gotten a different appreciation of of it, seeing it more closely, is w- what you said is is right on. Is you know, patient safety it, in healthcare, patient safety matters the most, right? That's the most important thing. So, so there's a lot of of process and and you know, stuff built in there to make sure that that happens, right? Um, that said, the FDA it also appears to be getting pretty, you know, and I, I have no inside information. I know, you know, I'm just saying this as, as somebody who watches the news. The FDA seems to be someone to be somewhat getting more and more interested in cybersecurity. You know, they they issued draft guidance last year around um, cybersecurity for medical devices. There um, there was an announcement. There was a news story two days ago that they're possibly having a cybersecurity summit or working group or something later this year. Like. I, I think I think this is really, um, you know, what you just, just just described in that hospital to me is the way I'd want it to work. You know, if I'm the one laying there waiting for for those medications that may save my life, I, I'm hoping that that I get them most effectively. Right. You know, whether or not there's a network problem. Right. I, I'll absolutely trade. Okay. Um, I'll absolutely trade uh, notes scribbled on a uh, clipboard sitting on top of a uh, a cart outside the door um, for getting medicine within, you know, a nominal delay as opposed to, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in the perfect yeah, world, dude, absolutely. in the perfect world, that wouldn't happen. But the reality is that, um, you know, this particular hospital, I won't, I won't name it for obvious reasons, but they did things that kind of concerned me at first. Uh, you know, there were a lot of there was a lot of paper redundancy, and then um, mm-hmm. it was oh okay, that's because I don't know if this was a common problem. I don't know what, but it was like oh well, there we go. Look, problem solved. We've got a workaround. They make notes and they eventually you know catch up on it. Like okay, there we go. You know what? That's that's fine, especially on you know the floor that I was on with the the issues that people were facing uh, in in that particular ward. It's like yep. Yep, don't screw around with this stuff. Take care of these people. So, uh. yeah, I mean, I, and I think, I mean, you just think about, just think about any workplace, right? I mean, we've all we've all worked in in sizable environments at some point. In in any sizable environment, you often have, you know, parts of the network down some significant amount of time. Um, when when my email goes down at work, I just go to the, you know, to the break room and grab a drink and sit there when when people's lives are on the line and that happens i i'm glad that there are processes i'm glad there's redundancy in that process right right you know if if the electricity goes out to the to the uh to the operating room i hope that there's some sort of manual process there or you know somebody standing there with a with a hand crank or i i don't know how that works but (laughs) Um, well, you know, when email goes down, my, you, I, want some, you want something to take over that maybe it's not the optimal solution, but it's better than people dying on, a, on an operating table. You know, when email goes down, I'm, I'm pretty sure that these smartphones we have can still be used to make calls. I don't know. I haven't really tried it out in a yeah. while, but I'm, that's what people tell me. <laughs> I'm just joking. I, uh, dude, uh, my, uh, the voice over IP on my desk stops working. I'll tell you, my desk, work, my desk phone stops. That's right. That's true today. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, and, and by the way, that is that is part of the the challenge too, right? I I, I don't I'm not a, a hospital guy. I've never worked at a hospital. I've had hospitals as clients before, but um, but uh, you know, they're all going to modern networking and things like that. Like Jack, the situation you're talking about, I'm I'm guessing all those carts were Wi-Fi and whatever. You lose a Wi-Fi access point on one of those floors. Um, you could lose all the connectivity to all of those devices on a floor. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it right? was. Uh, there were some issues with uh, with connectivity. Uh, the stuff that's really terrifying when you talk about connectivity issues are um, hospital wards where they're using telemetry to track uh, patients that are either self-medicating for pain because they're post-operative or other things that require uh, continuous monitoring. And uh, there's another place you don't want the network to fail. So speaking right. of uh, self-medicating for pain, Jack, you have a, a book over <laughs> here. <laughs> You oh, like yeah, that hey. segue, don't you? Oh, that was beautiful. So huh. let's see if Mike can that read. Was a, that was fantastic. <laughs> so let's see if Mike can read the title of this, and let me ask you uh, if you're having flashbacks here. Uh, oh, how was that? Is, is is that the camera that's live? Or oh, okay. Which Mike, can you see live? that book? I I don't know what I'm looking at. No, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, okay. What? what, what? The title is Liquid Vacation. 77 refreshing tropical drinks from Frankie's <laughs> Tiki Room in Las Vegas. Yep. <laughs> uh, you over that hangover I, yet? I know this book. <laughs> <laughs> I think what Jack said is you tried every single one of these drinks in this book in one night. Actually, I, I think you made it to the 78, I, right? We, we, I know we had a couple of 78s that night. Uh, yeah, we did have 78s, yes. Uh, I, I believe I don't know what page the bender ender is oh, on, that's but a, I wouldn't remember even if I had read it. Yeah, um, the bender ender is a, the bender ender is in is there somewhere. It's a classic. Uh, I had a bearded clam while I was there. That's in the bees too. That was really good. The bender ender. I think it's towards the end. But bender I don't know, ender a, to end I, I, a bender I, 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 or I, I, start a new. Are you sure you were actually in the, the bow when you had the bearded clam? Yeah. This, this is wondering. true. The bender ender. To end a bender or start a new one, you can't go wrong with this numbing jolt crowned with a float of 160 proof rum. Uh, there's dark rum. Yep. There's spiced rum. There's falernum. Filer falernum, which is a... What is a, that? It is a... I don't even know what that is. It's a liqueur, almond, and a whole bunch of other flavors. And they're so picky at Frankie's, they make their own falernum. Wow. And more rum. And more rum. And then they put a float <laughs> of uh, Stroh's 80, 160-proof dark spiced rum on top of it. Oh, I see that, yeah. Yeah, float of, just throw 80 floater. So anyway, yes, that's uh, Frankie's Tiki. Yeah, that, that, some pretty fantastic books, at, or drinks at Frankie's books, yeah. too, but uh, the drinks are pretty f phenomenal. I got to get a you copy You guys should get Frankie's to sponsor, the, uh, to sponsor the podcast. Uh, you know... <laughs> The number of people that I've introduced to Frankie's, uh, it's it's uh, it's amazing. <laughs> this one's actually uh, autographed by all of the authors of... Uh, oh, no way. Yeah. Wow. Yes. That's pretty wild, dude. It's, well, it's it's I, I sort of am an ambassador to Frankie's. Most folks on the podcast have heard, and other people have been dragged. I finally got you there. It, was I sh awesome. it should have occurred to me to mention cigars. Don't they, If it's a packed night, they, they prefer you don't smoke cigars. But on a quiet evening, a, a few folks smoking yeah. cigars is cool. Um, it's it's a great chill off strip place. Uh, I actually, Mike, I don't know if you heard this, but on Friday night after uh, Friday night of DefCon after John McAfee spoke, uh, John and his security detail and uh, John and his wife and his security detail joined me at Frankie's for a while for a little uh, you know chill out at Frankie's with uh, <laughs> McAfee and the security detail and some 303 folks, and that was an interesting evening, I will uh, say. No doubt. No <laughs> doubt it would have been. So, so, anyway. so Jack got me to, to, to Frankie's, but he did not have to drag me. In fact, I went quite willingly. And the 78 is absolutely a fabulous drink. So, uh, yeah. well, as are many others. Yeah, I uh, yeah. Actually, I asked the uh, bartender, I just said, just make me something. He goes, what's your preference? I was like, yeah, do some gin, something or other. And, and what came out was just this most fantastic concoction. That place is just terrific. Can't say enough about it. Yeah, in it, fact, it, the it, uh, it highest compliment I can give the bartenders to there is to say, my liver is in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. um, so, Mike, was there anything else, or anyone on the uh, the panel want to ask Mike a uh, question, topic? We'll throw that out there Suddenly first. I feel like this is a job, this is a job interview. That's We've right. Got four people all, all going to ask yes. you questions. So, Mike, what would you like to do in five years from now? Yeah. <laughs> where, where do you see yourself? In yeah. five years, yeah. That's a classic uh, job yeah. question. Uh, Mike, was there anything? I, I, 
What's that? Oh, are you oh, going to answer, answer that? I was going to answer that. I'm Go for it. Because I was going to say, because if, if you had asked me five years ago, which is probably around when I did my first Paul.com podcast, if I would be at a large company five years from now, I probably would have said no. So I'm not even going to attempt to guess. Yeah, you would have laughed. Yeah, five years ago, you probably would have laughed at the idea that you would be where you are now. Yeah, so I, I do I have a question, though. Go ahead, um, Mick. You know, looking no, forward, no, no plan survives. What is it? Uh, the Lee Kushner always always quoted Mike Tyson. He says everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. Right. And you know, uh, I think uh, I think my career path is probably a perfect demonstration of that. Mick, did you have a question? Yeah. So, looking forward, do you see things potentially rosy and hopeful, or are we just going to be continuing yeah. to? do Internet of Things getting more and more stuff together and having bigger and bigger breaches. And the reason I ask is that as the medical stuff gets more Internet enabled, do I have to start be, you know, considering becoming Neo-Amish or something? Well, you can't be. Let, uh, let me, let me, uh, you hit a button. So let me, you can, it doesn't matter if you're Neo-Amish because right. somebody else is going to expose you. You know, it's the friend of a friend exposure. Uh, you're going to have to have insurance. You're going to interact with people that you have to trust. You know, do you are you are you going to not have your healthcare records available to your, uh, you know, from your primary care physician to the ER? It's like, yeah, you know what? I'll take that risk. Uh, and then I'll just let Mike yeah. answer. But I just had an instant reaction no, no. to that. Je Jack's reaction was right, and I, I think so. I think the answer is yes and yes. I think yes, we are going to have bigger and bigger breaches because we're going to have more and more records. I mean. Um, Target and J.P. Morgan were quite huge. Um, you know, you'd think we would get it right by now, but the truth is, we just have more and more data out there. Um, I think, I think the the place where it's going to get interesting. I mean, we're really going Internet of Things. This is not a GE thing because we're not. We don't do any of this stuff. But I've seen lots of companies that. I mean, there's, there's huge things in wearables right now. Like every everybody and their mothers. Have, developing some sort of wearable device. I'm waiting for the first level set of implantables. You know, I, maybe I just missed it because I've been too busy, but uh, I haven't seen, I haven't seen a whole lot of really interesting implantable devices yet, but I fully expect that five years from now, my Fitbit's going to be, you know, injectable in some way or ingestible. Um, that's going to report back to the cloud with interesting telemetry on my body. And frankly, I, I don't see any of that as a bad trend, but it's going to make more and more data, and it's going to make more and more data to be breached. I, I don't I, – personally, I see us getting better at security every year. I also see the bad guys getting better at being bad guys every year. Um, you know, the, the hackers that took down J.P. Morgan seemed pretty damn sophisticated, and, and I would take them, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a hacker street fight, I'd take them over pretty much – any of the script kiddies of the 90s that were the people that we were worrying about for the most part between 1997 and 2003. Like, I think the bad guys get better and the security gets better all at the same time and there's more data, so there's more at risk. Um, that said, I think it is rosy. I think we are getting better at this and we are getting smarter. And, you know, it's just going to keep improving going forward, even though sometimes the news doesn't make it look like it's improving. Yeah, How is I that just for a yes to both sides of the question. I hope those wearables are are not inserted in particular orifices because that wouldn't be a very good marketing feature. Dude, were you at the fail panel this I, year? I, I was me, not, unfortunately. Let me just say, insertion is uh, you know. <laughs> all right, what the hell? Look, I just set myself up for the um, <clears throat> all the old guy stuff. You know the stuff where they can insert without using a uh, without stabbing a hole in you uh, starts to look better as you get it's more true. and more things jammed into you. So means they can pull it out right. with a little KY and a pair of tweezers. You know, <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. <then. laughs> where did uh, where were we? Where, uh, where on earth is the show going to go from here? <laughs> Mike, was there anything else along those lines that you wanted to add? <laughs> or, to your, or along other lines, along too. Along other yeah. lines. I don't think I'm going to add anything along those lines. I will say that. Are you ready to do five questions? Have you played five questions before? 
I've never played five questions. This is a new game. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Wait. So just just out of curiosity, did you take this from Kevin Pollock? No. I stole it from Bully Beatdown. It's a long story. It was a ridiculous show. The, the host got arrested. Anyway, I'll fill you in after the show. Are you ready now? That's awesome. Yes. Okay. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, okay, two more. Slow answering questions. <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Hmm. Plastic bag. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Bad writing titles. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I have no idea what game that is, but I always tend to put myself out there. I'll go first. It's popular in Europe. If you could and pick... Must be. <laughs> if Definitely you, not something we played in Canada growing up. But. <laughs> if you could pick any two celebrities to be your parents, who would they be? Oh. Hmm. Sydney Poitier and Dame Judi Dench. Ooh. Very nice. good. Good answers. Nice. Good answers. Nice. And relatively fast, too. That was a, possibly one of the fastest answers to so, that question. Yeah, uh, that one was. That, so I learned something recently that, that made me so much more impressed. I always wondered why they called her Dame Judi. Dame Judy Dench. I didn't know what the word why they always called her Dame, and I didn't know that that was this that that was the um, the equivalent of a female knighthood. With, with a man with a man who's been knighted, we call them Sir. Uh, apparently, the female is Dame. I did not know that. Learn something so new I was every super day. Impressed by Thank her. you for instilling your knowledge, as useless as it is, with our listeners, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that, somebody's going to TIL that on, on Reddit at some point, just because I said it. Mike, thank you so much for appearing on Security <laughs> Weekly. Uh, it's been wonderful having you, as always. Always, Paul, and any time, seriously. Yes, uh, thank I, you I so just much. love hanging out and, and chatting about stuff that we like talking about. So. Awesome. awesome. Thanks again. We're going to take a short break, come back, and have a fabulous technical segment with Mr. Mick Douglas. So stay tuned. 